Welcome to the show. We have the one and only Mr. Quiet Storm, one of the greatest radio hosts of all time, Lenny Green. You're very Lenny nice. Green, how's it going? Everything is going well, brother. Can't complain, man. Just working hard, you know, um, and stay, staying on the grind. You know, as when you get to a certain age, you got to work hard, you know, and stay in, in, in the mix of everything. And I'm a Brooklyn cat, so I know about competition and working hard, like you do, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> You're exactly right. I, I want to get into not just your beginnings, but what you're doing right now, especially on Instagram Live with Off Mic, because you've had to adjust to the times right now with COVID-19 and the pandemic. How has that been for you as an experience of taking over on Instagram and the social media world as a radio host and personality that's so used to just being on the mic on radio? Max, I realized one thing in this game of radio or any industry that you be in, you have to you know, advance with, with time. And you just can't be in a time warp zone. You know, just can't stay in the 80s. You can't stay in the 90s. You have to move as time moves. And technology has moved. And just as much as I reach an audience uh, by God's grace through radio, there's a huge audience that is in a whole separate lane on the internet. And by us using these social media platforms, as we are doing right now, it allows our brand to expand even even more. Um, um, there's a, <clears throat> people that follow me on Instagram that may not even listen to my radio show and vice versa. <laughs> so it's all about just growing with the times and staying relevant. And I, I got to shout out uh, the R&B superstar himself, Tank, because Tank was really the one I was having a casual conversation with him. And he was the one who kind of planted the seed in my head to do something when he just said, hey, man, you know, if you want to do something, man, I, I'm available for you. I'm like, really? And I said, okay. And I thought about it for like maybe a couple of days and I hit him back and said, hey man, why don't you, why don't we do it? Why don't we jump it off? You know, and we'll do something on Instagram. And that's how I came up with Off Mic. And it's been a very interesting ride and it's been very, it allows me to talk more in depth. It allows me to talk about a variety of different issues because radio, especially what I do, Max, with the, uh, with the Quiet Storm, I'm creating the mood for you. You don't want to hear me talk and talk and talk. You, you, you with your lady. You want to hear, like, dude, we don't mind hearing you talk, but play my music. Don't blow my mood. So um, the off mic on, on Instagram that I do um, is a wonderful opportunity for me to connect with a different audience, my audience, and uh, get more in depth with my special guests. Mm -hmm. It's been in a great time watching your Instagram lives and enjoying the interviews that you conduct. I saw that you had After 7 on recently. Yeah, man, that's one of my uh, that's one of my favorite groups. As quiet as kept, bro. I uh, I have a fond love for music first. Uh, I thought I was going to be Michael Jackson the second. That's right. God had a different intention for me, um, and I embrace those who do the craft of music and express their gift if they're blessed with vocals uh, all the time. So I'm glad that uh, after seven and I we have built up a, a wonderful a rapport with each other. So it was great having those cats on. Born in Crown Heights, raised in Canarsie and Bushwick, eventually going to Kingsborough Community College, and that's how you found your love of college radio. Correct. Uh, that's how I found radio. Not to say I was absent from it, you know. Um, are you born and raised in Brooklyn as well? I I'm actually born and raised in Connecticut, which is also interesting because you had your own time in Connecticut on the radio. What part of Connecticut were you from? Fairfield County. Okay, that's what's up. Yeah, that yeah. was from uh, where I was. Uh, yeah, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting how, how life goes, man. And um, well, I'm off track. I'm off track, Max. It's a little too early. So re rewind just a minute. Put me back on track. What was the question again? Oh, yes. When you found your love of radio in college at Kingsborough Community College, because you had your own time slot on the station, seven hours. And that's a spiritual number for you. Seven has been with me for a long time, and it is a spiritual number. You know, seven is the number for those of you who are watching. Seven is the number of completion. And um, I feel that, and I know that, God has put me in this lane for me to embellish on, and I'm grateful for the gifts that he has given me. Uh, yeah, but, but I didn't know about radio in terms of wanting to do it. Uh, growing up in New York, um, I listened to some phenomenal voices over the years. Little did I know it was having a subconscious um, influence on me. So by the time I did get to Kingsborough Community College and 
they invited me to come by the radio station, uh, Mad Max, I, I instantly fell in love with what I saw. And I said, it was like almost forget about singing and focus on radio. And I did that. And they, gave, they asked me, well, what kind of show would you like to do? And I said, um, smooth jazz, because my older brother uh, would always play smooth jazz around the house. So that's all I would know. So um, they said, hey, go ahead and do it. So it was a Sunday night, man. I wasn't driving at the time. And if anybody's from Brooklyn that's watching or from New York, I'm out in past Brighton Beach. And on a Sunday, I got off the air at 1 o'clock or 12 o'clock. On a Sunday, there's only one bus left to bring you back to the train station. And me and one of my guys who was working with me, we would haul ass to try to get out of that studio after we played that last song to catch that bus. Otherwise, we would have to take a cab. But you know, being a college student, you don't have that kind of money to kind of just throw away like that and do cabs. Like, who was doing cabs at that time? <laughs> took the bus and jump on that train to get back home. So yeah, man, it was just a wonderful, a wonderful journey, a wonderful experience, and an eye-opening opportunity for me to finally realize where God was pointing me, and that was to do what I'm loving. Every single day I get an opportunity to do it, radio. From there, your time at college radio, how were you able to get onto the station in Connecticut and then eventually Kiss FM? Uh, well, that was, um, it went actually from radio working at a radio syndication company in New York, then taking on a job. I negotiated a job and took on a radio job where they paid me and took care of my rent by putting me up in a hotel for like six months in Richmond, Virginia. That was before Connecticut. That only lasted, you know that when there's a problem, Mad Max, when the, the, the manager of the hotel comes to you and said, Mr. Green, um, do you know when the radio station is going to pay your bill? And my antennas went up. I'm like, oh, this is not good. Because the only thing I would do is sign the weekly bill and they would send the bill to be paid to the radio station because the radio station said they had a relationship with the hotel. This is in Richmond, Virginia. So once that happened, it only lasted like, like I said, maybe six months. I came back to New York and I started working just odd jobs. And then someone told me about this part-time job on the weekend in Connecticut. And uh, I went up and I met the program director and he said, hey, man, I can give you, can give you a, a slot on Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I was already working in New York, Monday through Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday. So I was working nonstop, pretty much what I'm doing right now. I work nonstop, seven days a week. And after a year of doing part-time work, this was the only, this was the AM station, though, brother. AM station in the late 80s, early 90s, and we were competing against an FM station, which was Yale University, right, in New Haven. And we were winning. The AM station was beating out the FM station because we had a relationship with the record company. So when Mary J. Blige first came out, when Usher first came out, when Boys to Men, Mint Condition first came out, we actually brought them to the city brought them to the club. They performed their very first big hits because of that radio station. So we became a favorite of, uh, of, of the market in New Haven. So after a year doing that, they offered me a full-time job in New Haven. And I ended up staying there for like nine years. And then um, when they started going through their changes, I, I met a mutual friend along the way. And uh, he would always say to me that he was good friends with a program director in New York called Vinnie Brown. Vinnie Brown was the godfather, but he became my godfather because he's the one who actually opened up the opportunity for me to come to New York to work at Kiss FM. But Vinnie Brown had already been in the business for a long time. He's one of the, he's one of those guys, you know, one of the top dogs of radio, knew, knew his stuff. And he had brought Kiss FM to number one. And he gave me a job that I didn't know was coming. Uh, he, he, I remember my first meeting with him he said, hey, man, I don't have any slots. I don't have any jobs available. I got all my part-time announcers. I got my fill-in announcers. got my full-time announcers. Do you want the job? Do I want the job you don't have for me? Do you want the job? I'll take the job, sir. Max, 
Uh, I walked out of that office just as confused as you probably hearing this right now. And two weeks later, he called me up and said, look, I don't have no on air work for you, but I need you to come in here and just answer the phones and open up the mail. I can only pay you $10 an hour. Do you want it? I want it. Because the way I look at this, Max, mm -hmm. I went from not being in the building to coming in the building. <laughs> and my thought was, somebody may get sick one day, and guess who could do it? I can. You fill in. So that's how it happened. Someone got sick one day, and he said, I need you on the air. Can you do it? Now, this is the mid part of the day on 98.7 Kiss FM. The the biggest station, one of the biggest stations in New York, because it was BLS and Kiss FM. Bomb. I was, excuse my friend, shitting bricks. But I said, yes, sir, I, I'll do it. I'll do it. And that's where everything started. And that's how it all started. Quiet Storm began. And it's kind of interesting looking at WBLS right now because Cool DJ Red Alert was on Kiss FM. DJ Chuck Chillout was on Kiss FM. And now is you were on KISS FM, you're all on WBLS now. Yeah, man, you know what? The miracles of God, brother, I cannot begin to tell you how often and how much uh, I am so thankful for his blessings. And, and that's what they are, Max, they're, they're blessings. And, and I, don't take his, I don't take God's blessings for granted. I look at them as wonderful uh, golden moments that are precious and that I hold dear to my heart. And uh, who would ever thought I didn't think at the time, but I was listening to Cool GJ Red Alert do his thing on Saturdays or listening to Chuck Chill Out that I would actually be working and they would become my colleagues. And we bonded so naturally well when we did uh, meet for the first time. And, you know, it's it's nothing but family now, but I, I'm i living my biggest dream. That's why I'm a firm believer, Max, in a um, dream. And I know some people say, well, you're living in a false you know, perspective of life. And I don't look at it the same way. I look at anything is possible. Dude. Anything is possible in life. Anything. I just so happen to have a phenomenal father, and that father is God. And uh, I believe that if you're most passionate about something, not saying it's going to happen when you want it to happen, because nothing happens when you want it to happen. But I do. I'm a firm believer that if you work hard at your craft and you are passionate about it, and you stay in line with what you need to stay in line with, and if you're a faithful person, you know about the whole spiritual thing then you walk by faith and not by sight, and it will happen. But nothing happens overnight. We all want things, and I'm no exception to the rule. We all want things when we want them, but God doesn't work in that way. He gives it to us when, we, when he thinks we're ready for it, because when, they're re when you're ready for it, then it's no stopping it. And once God opens up an opportunity for me, nobody on this earth can close it. I mean, they might be able to close an opportunity for me to advance, but they're not going to stop my blessings because my blessings come from the highest supreme. So I'm, I'm just thankful. Man. How did this idea come about for the quiet storm? Because it is a movie. When you turn on that radio station, 7 PM, it's a movie, especially if you're with your girl. <laughs> I like to make, I'm glad you used those wonderful words because I like to make it an experience. And that experience is called the movie, the quiet storm experience. And um, I can't take credit for the quiet storm. The, the history of the quiet storm started, on the campus of W, uh, on the campus of Howard University, which is in Washington D.C., the radio station is WHUR. Now, being born in New York, growing up, didn't know about that until I learned and studied it. There was a there's a woman who everyone should know, including you, um, who is she is a media guru. She has grown her her company to unbelievable heights. Her name is Miss Kathy Hughes. Kathy Hughes owns the conglomerates of Radio One, which includes TV stations and radio stations. But at the time when she was also on radio, do, hosting a show on WOL in Washington, DC, as time moved on and she grew up the ladder, she became a part of WHUR and she actually placed Melvin Lindsay is the brother's name. Melvin Lindsay was the first man on radio to actually do The Quiet Storm and incorporate the Smokey Robinson song. So that had to be, Smokey Robinson, Smoke Quiet Storm song came out in 1974, if I'm not mistaken. So they used that as the theme to open up the show as everybody who does the Quiet Storm does these days. So that's where the Quiet Storm concept, that's where the Quiet Storm name initially came from. 
Um, and there's different variations of it. When I was working in Connecticut, we did a Quiet Storm format, meaning we played love songs, but we called it Whisper Softly. When I got to 98.7 Kiss, with the Quiet Storm already being birthed at WBLS, we couldn't call it the Quiet Storm, so we called it Kissing After Dark. Same concept. So um, I'm just, uh, again, uh, again, a wonderful opportunity and wonderful blessing for me to be placed in the category of uh, doing this and for me to have built a relationship with, with one of the mentors, with one of the golden voices of radio that did the Quiet Storm in New York for years. And his name is Vaughn Harper. So for him to literally, and I do, I will never forget this moment, Max. I was at his birthday party and, you know, I had a moment where I was up at the mic with him and he actually passed me the mic. And wow. symbolically, you know, I didn't catch it at the time. Uh, he eventually had gotten ill after that. You know, his, his health was declining. And um, I was like, wow, that, that, that was the most sacred moment that I, that I missed because the, the passing of the mic, like from one generation to the next, like you carry the torch, I carried the torch, now it's your turn to carry the torch. And we built a, such a strong friendship prior to that happening. And then after that happened, uh, up until, you know, uh, he got sick and transitioned. But uh, Vaughn Harper was the man in New York. And if anybody who is of a certain age watching this, you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants and he's one of the giants I stand on. A hundred percent. He paved the way for you and you're paving the way for other people out there who listen to your show. You can tell, especially when the guests come on your show and you do the introductions that they actually have a great time. I remember Keep Sweat. He loved your introduction when he was on the show. Plenty of all your guests. They love what you do when you have the opening monologues. I, you know what? And, and I don't plan them all the time. You know, sometimes it just comes from the heart. But then when I do get um, some kind of indication that let me write down this to introduce them, because everyone everyone deserves a, a, a wonderful introduction at times. You know what I'm saying? And they have paved the way and, and they are they paid their act. They, they deserve more accolades on top of what they've achieved. So I'm honored when they uh, like what I do because it. I don't think anything of it. I just said, well, let me put this together. And this is what I'm thinking. And again, we, I believe in experiences, man. You know, I think life is a wonderful journey if we can uh, experience certain things. I think people remember uh, certain things. Like, they'll forget about what you say, but they, they won't forget about an experience or what they went through with you. And even when we were fortunate before this COVID thing happened to bring guests in the studio, I always wanted to make the experience right. So I would go out. And like if I had a, a female artist or some kind of celebrity come in, I would buy the ladies flowers just because they're coming to the quiet storm. They're coming for an evening to sit down with me for an hour. I would have fruit. I would have juices. I would have water, you know, just laid out on the table. And they're like, oh, and when I, once I heard the first, oh, I'm like, well, I guess nobody really did this in this way. So I would actually, you know, when you go to certain things, especially called a green room at TV stations, it's a little room, they have coffee, tea, water, and then you sit and chill before you go up into the main studio. So I guess I'm bringing the green room experience to the radio station. And uh, a lot of guests were, were not accustomed to that. And sometimes, you know, we are doing a quiet storm. Sometimes I would have wine or champagne. So I pour them a glass of wine and champagne. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> let's do it. So I kept that concept going. Which interviews do you think you cherish the most throughout your career? You sat down with a lot of people, the Jackson Five, Smokey Robinson, Ronald Isley. Who are some of those interviews that you cherish most? All of them. All, all of them, man. Uh, especially the, the iconic ones. You know, Shaka Khan, um, Barry White, Smokey, um, Isaac Hayes, who's not only, who wasn't only became a friend. He's the one who introduced me to this hairstyle, Isaac Hayes. Um, Ronald Isley. All the ones that you just mentioned. Luther Vandross, um, the iconic ones, because they are the ones who created the foundation for uh, the new generation, again, of music to come in. So all of those are wonderful, but you know, I, the new ones, just as much, like everyone from Tank to Genuine to After Seven to Babyface, and those lists goes on. So it's really hard to say which ones, um, because they all are different and they're all special. Like it's different when I have an interview with with um, uh, Smokey Robinson or uh, Jennifer Lewis, Jennifer, actress Jennifer Lewis, she's on Blackish. You know, she is. She has a great personality. She's 
very colorful and she brings a lot of energy to uh, to the show. Um, not to mention she's on a hit show. So, but it's so it's different energies, and you know this because you you're around a lot of people. You do this all the time as well. So different energies that come to your format to come to your program, you kind of feed off that energy, and that energy takes you to a different level. And you can't get that energy, or you might get a different experience with the next person. So um, that's why I say they're all different. It's hard to pinpoint one or two because I really do appreciate all of them that I do. Mm-hmm. One interview that I enjoyed that you did was when you interviewed R. Kelly because you brought him cigars. When I look back on that interview now, man, wow, you brought up a very interesting situation. And then, you know, with, with all the controversy and, and the documentary that came out of R. Kelly, I'm like, woo. Now, you have to understand, that wasn't my first meeting with R. Kelly. Mm. Um, we had met prior to that. And when you know when when artists of that magnitude come to town a radio station doesn't get always a, a chance to sit down one-on-one so they would bring them in to kind of give everyone a, an idea of what happens behind the scenes they'll say well r kelly's coming to town now we're in the 90s r kelly's hot right um so he can't go he can't come to everybody's show <clears throat> so they'll set up times okay lenny you'll do at 10 o'clock uh max you're going to do at 10 15 like you only get a bit of time with them so he's may have hit like five different shows at the same time. So what happened the first time we met, I was assistant program director, music director at KISS FM. Mm-hmm. I was scheduled to do an interview with him. The brother who was before me did the interview and I don't know what he said to him because we're not in the room. Only thing I remember after R. Kelly was in there five minutes, I see him get up, comes over to me, Where's the bathroom? Over there, man. Bathroom's over there. All right, cool. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Comes back my way. All right, we're out. You're out? Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's up? We're out, man, we're out. What happened was the cat who did the interview with him asked him something about Aaliyah. Mm. That was a while ago. It didn't sit well with R. Kelly. Got up, out. So needless to say, my interview never happened. So that was the second time, but now the paradigm has changed. I'm with a different station. I'm with WBLS now. I'm hosting the Choir Storm. I'm not the music director. I do the interview. I know he likes cigars. I'm a cigar smoker as well. To be honest with you, I didn't think he was gonna take all of my cigars. He took all of my damn cigars. And I was kind of annoyed at that, but I was like, He's R. Kelly. I'm going to give this brother because I'm all about, as you are, building relationships. Building relationships, no matter what industry you're in, is quintessential. It's not about all the time just knowing the person. It's about, again, creating the experience and building the relationship with people because relationships get us to different levels of life. It's about the relationship. You could go for a job that may have you the executive producer, Max, of a TV show. And you'll meet with the guy who's supposed to hire you. He's not, he's going to talk about everything around the job description to see how Max is, where he's here, where he is in his heart. And then he's going to make a determination if he wants you to have that job. So, you know, building experiences. So I brought the cigars because I know he's a cigar smoker. And again, I create the experience. I give you something different when you come to my interviews, when you sit down with me. So that way, when it's time for them to come back around, like, oh, I remember you. And that's what I want. The experience made you never forget. So I, I enjoyed the interview. Uh, I don't know how much of that interview you listened to. He gave me all the answer, you know, all the answers that you know I wanted at the time. I wasn't about thinking about during the R. Kelly interview. His I, I know about what happened with Aaliyah. That wasn't my concern. Again, I remember what also pissed them off. So why am I going to talk about something that was so old that we all heard about it? It's over. I'm with you right here, right now. People want to know about right here, right now. Let's talk about right here, right now. That's what you talked to him about, black panties in the buffet. That was his newer work. Right here, right now, man. Let's talk. I know he's in, I know he's not gonna get up and walk because this is your new project. <laughs> so let's talk about the black panties. I think it's sexy too. It fits perfectly into the quiet storm. I love a woman who, you know, dresses in lingerie. It's sexy. It's, I love it. So 
right here, right now. That's we're gonna keep this conversation right here in this lane where I know you're most comfortable in. I know what you want to talk about. We're gonna embellish on this, and we're gonna have a good talk conversation. What's your opinion on how R&B has changed over time, especially today in the modern era? Because you come from the generation of listening to not just the the 90s legends, but the artists that came before then. Now it seems as though R&B artists have fell back on using auto-tune in their music, and it's not the raw soul vocals. I want to know your opinion on how R&B has changed over time. Well, you know, I, I think that the download or the uh, dilute of R&B came when music uh, classes were starting to be eliminated out of schools. and that was the initial transformation. So a lot of people who had desires to do music had to resort to other measures because the classes were being done, you know, um, music classes where instruments could be learned how to be played or chorus. When I was in high school, I think I was in the last chorus, uh, you know, kind of situation um, that was in, in, in high school at the time. So when those things started to eliminate, you know, when people have a desire and a passion for something, they resort to whatever means they can. Technology advance, so we learned about auditors. I can't, that person can't sing well, or we can make, just sing, and we can make it sound good. Um, I, the rawness of, of, of a gift, when you nurture it, when you work on it to enhance it, um, really shows the true ap appreciation for what you want to do. I've seen a lot of artists, and I won't mention their names, that were great singers, but have become better singers they got over because of the, of the production, meaning the beats, the groove of the song, it was compelling to the audience and they had hit records. They weren't great singers at the time. I've seen their growth and now they have become great singers because they poured more into their craft. When you pour more into your craft, you become better at doing it. When you start concentrating, when you find out, well, how can I do, how can I learn how to do this better? What do I need to do? Do I need to work on my speech? Do I need to change up my style? Do I need to, you know, enhance my, my, my vocal range if I'm a singer? Do I need to learn certain things if I'm, if I'm a musician? Do I need to learn how to read better? Do I need to help how to uh, creatively come up with solos better? So you learn how to pour into your, your gift and you become better at doing it. And that's how you grow. I think R&B music has taken on, yeah, we diluted it a little bit, but we can't measure R&B just by what we hear on the radio because they're, are an enormous amount of R of R and B, or what, as we learned to find out, it was created neo soul that was just as good as R and B. It was a still form of R and B, just neo soul that got exposed, but those artists didn't get exposed because they weren't appealing to commercial radio, but they were appealing across the board. Now, look, you got an artist out, you know, you have many artists out these days that may not get radio play. But going back to what you had said a little earlier in our conversation about social media, they are big on social media. Well, guess what? Now that the paradigm has changed, not only for singers, but even for the music industry. And industry, uh, you know, record companies are not looking solely at just your gift. They're looking at how many followers do you have? And when they can see that you have over 300 or 400,000 people that are following you, and they know the impact of that can have an effect on your, your, your record sales. Now, the record companies are paying attention to you. Well, look, this cat, he, you know, he got a following without our help. That can't happen. We're losing out on money. So let's get behind him and let's work it out. So I think r and it has never lost its base. The base of r and has always been there, not only with the iconic figures that have held it down so strongly, but with the newer and younger generations that have come. Like, I don't know, have you heard of a singer by the name of Kevin Ross? Yes, I, I, he's been on my show, actually. Phenomenal singer, got yeah. signed to Motown. So that generation, that younger generation, and, and the brother, you know, he's in his mid to maybe late 20s. You know, he's coming even stronger. Um, and there's so many like him that, have, that are working out through the, through, through the cracks and up through the way. So I think r and I don't think r and will ever go away. I think there are different dimensions. And just like any genre of music, you have good and bad. Uh, you have different levels. And I think we have a variation of r and that is still great r and And I think more and more we are hearing about 
these new artists, these younger artists, uh, enhancing and embellishing and growing R&B to the next level, like the Brutal Mars. And Trey Songs, Trey Songs, you're a fan of as well. Yes, Trey Songs, another one. You know, so R&B is just. It may have taken a slight pause, but it's never going to die. Thank God. And um, the newer generation appreciates what those who have walked before them have done. And I think these newer R&B superstars that are already in the making or who have established themselves are definitely trying to bring quality music and bring it to their next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Would you ever work with an artist? Let's say we've heard the intros on boys to men songs, such as 50 candles. Would you ever do something such as that on an artist of that caliber level, such as boys to men or any other R and B artist that's legendary and do an intro for them, such as you do on the quiet storm, your show. It's so funny. Um, as quiet as it's kept, I just finished working with a group, old school group, by the name of full course, they're brothers. Um, I did something for them. It hasn't leaked yet. But Max, I may, I may send it to you so you can hear it. Uh, and I just did something with two hot uh, producers that are Miami-based, and they have done so much over the years. Cool and Dre. Cool and Dre. Um, Dre is, I, I, I only can speak and say this. I know Dre is working on his solo project, and um, I have the opportunities in... Um, being on his solo project in the capacity that you had just said. Oh, that's amazing. Congratulations on that. Dre is one of the hottest producers in the game right now. Of course, he's making hits left and right, especially with Fat Joe and shout out to what they're doing. What album in your mind from the 90s is the definition of 90s R&B? You know, again, we, we spoke about him. I mean, R. Kelly dominated the 90s. I was, I was going to say 12 play. <laughs> well, that, that album alone. Yeah. That, al that, that was, that was the quintessential album that I love and I still love it. I can't, you know, you, we understand what challenges R. Kelly person is going through. We pray that, uh, you know, he finds something he grows, but you can't take away his gifts. His talent was and is impeccable. You know, his writing skills, his creativity when it came to music, it's it's a gift. It's a gift, man. So he dominated the '90s. So we could pick any. Don't beat me up, y'all. I mean, any R&B song from from R. Kelly is great. Um, I'm big on After Seven as well. I'm big on um, wow. I, I like I like Brandy in the '90s. I like Monica in the '90s, and I love wow. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that. I'm gonna stick with those. Right Intro, I think intro is underrated with Kenny Green. He penned a lot of hits, especially for Mary J. Blige. He did, he did. And he would, you know, so it's so sad that Kenny, unfortunately, transitioned. Uh, he had a whole big life ahead of him. Um, yeah, so Kenny Green, definitely. But, you know, now you, if you want to get into producers, you know, again, um, we're talking about main condition. We're talking about uh, baby face again, not, not as a singer, but just as a producer. I mean, if you look at the body of work that, that Babyface and another producer by the name of Daryl Simmons, they were a team, uh, has done for the 90s. They dominated every song. And talk about Boys to Men, look at, look at who wrote the song. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Babyface. I'm like, damn. Uh, Babyface, Babyface wrote a song for a woman, and I, the name escapes me at the moment. And it, 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 was, it was like the woman's anthem. I was like, how did you do that? Like, you know, you're a man and you write a song for a woman and this song went number one. I, I, I'm i drawing a blank at the moment, but I'll have to hit you back and let you know what it is. It's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. And and bringing up a, a special album was the Isley Brothers 1996 album in which I believe Keith Sweat, Babyface, and R. Kelly came together to work with them on that as R. Kelly actually rejuvenated the career of Ronald Isley. He became Mr. Big, especially on Down Low. And eventually you saw him move into the 2000s and as well as him working with Uncle Charlie Wilson. You hit the nail on the head and you did your research great. Um, Uncle Charlie Wilson and, and Ronald Isley, he gave them new life. Uh, you know, for Uncle Charlie Wilson, um, last name Wilson, first name Charlie, that's R. Kelly. That became a hit. Again, you know, he... 
R. Kelly is blessed with that gift, man. I'm just sorry things happened for him the way they did. Uh, but yeah, and then he gave new light to a whole new generation uh, to Ron Rising with Mr. Biggs. I remember the first time I had, I was working at BLS and we had, you know, we were right there. Well, we were right there with Hot 97 because Hot 97 has always been my sister station. And it was a Friday and Ronald Isley came to town. And on Friday, it's at the radio station. You know, a lot of, a lot of cats at Hot 97 cats, they, they come up or their friends come up and people just, it's just Friday. So, the, you know, everyone's kind of like hanging out and partying. So I said, you know what? I'm going to walk for him, Mr. Biggs, right by to go to the studio that I'm going to record him in. And everybody's talking. And then all of a sudden, everyone shut up. Because they saw me coming down the hall, they saw who was behind me, and he was in classic Ronald Isley, you know, style. Why well, I say Mr. Big style, dark, dark sunglasses, the cool walk. His wife was behind him or walking with him, and his wife is way younger than him, right? <laughs> he was to say the entire group of people that were standing around just like, oh, yo, that's Mr. Big, yo, that's Mr. Big. I'm like. It cracked me up, man, because I knew he was going to have an impact on these young cats. Because they don't know him as Ronald Isley. They know him as Mr. Biggs, mm -hmm. the gangster. Mr. Biggs, the pimp-like, you know? So, again, it, yeah, man, 1996 for, for the Isley brothers with that, with the Mr. Biggs things was huge. And, again, uh, owed to the creative mindset of R. Kelly for Charlie Wilson and um, Ronald Isley. Yeah, and Marcus Houston, plenty of others. There was also a time in the 90s when there was this – trend of r&b artists using their names as the titles of their album brian mcknight did it r kelly did it with r keith sweat did it with keith sweat his 96 album why do you think that was why these r&b artists were using their names as the title of their album during that time oh man it's all about brand awareness it's still about brand awareness i mean you know um i try to put my brand on t-shirts you know uh i you know since the pandemic i i've slacked off on that but now that things are getting a little better it's all about keeping your brand in people's faces because you want to have that impact. I mean, that's where hashtags came along. Uh, and that plays a big role back into social media as well. You know, you got hashtag um, DJ Mad Max, you know, hashtag Lenny Green, hashtag The Quiet Storm. It has impact to people. And the more you brand your brand, the more you keep it up in people's face, um, I think it has more an effect in, in people remembering and connecting and not forgetting you. So it's all about brand awareness. I, I'm, I'm 100% for that. And I think, uh, yeah, we're known for singers to do that. But we as media people, I do it. I, I'm sure you do it too. We have to. 100%, especially in social media era. It's important. It's, it's, it's extremely important. And uh, it, it pays on down the line. You know, if I'm doing an interview with an actor, you know, I'll say actor's life. You know, I'll say, I'll hashtag their movie, the popular movies that they've been in. Uh, I'll hashtag their name, even though their name may be at Kevin Hart, you know, on social media, I'll still hashtag because then everything will come up um, and be associated with that. You know, I think when you go on Wikipedia, it says associated with, an, an, on the side things, you know, associated with, and it gives the list of people who this person uh, may be associated with, whether it's a record company, whether it's another person, so it's the same thing, you know, I, brand awareness is brand awareness. And I think that what I think I never asked that question. I think that was a great question that you asked. Um, it's something I definitely will do research on to find out why. But it's just like, um, you may not remember this, but when Keith Sweat came out and Al B. Shore came out, um, they toured, toured mm -hmm. on their first album. Now, you don't see that a lot anymore. No. So they did, they did these little small club venues all around the city. As a matter of fact, I was working in New Haven, Connecticut, excuse me, at the time. And I remember each of them coming by, playing the small venue, because again, no one, everyone was just getting to know them. Their first song, each one of their first songs, I think I'll Be Sure was Night and Day, and then uh, Keith Sweat was um, I Want You. They, those songs were already being played on the radio. But so you figured, okay, you only got one song that's being played on the radio, but they toured and they performed every song on that album. So if you go back and listen to their first albums and why people love those first albums so much, going 
again, back to brand awareness, they sold, they really sold us on those first albums. And that's all they would perform, song after song. They didn't introduce no second album. They, they just did everything that was on that first album. And you could drop a needle on Albert Shore's first album, which came out in 88, maybe 89, or maybe, yeah, right, in the late 80s. And you're gonna know it if you know about his music, you're gonna know it. it that's an iconic album, Al B. Shore, I mean, Keith Sweat, his first album that Teddy Riley did, that's an iconic album. Song for song, you're gonna know the songs that did play and the songs that didn't, but you're gonna just know it. Especially, ladies, I know you know, so it's a given. That I'll be sure song I think is underrated off of his first album is Ooh, This Love Is So. But again, that's what he performed when he came to the, to the, you know, to these little venues. Ooh, this love. So it is underrated, but it's not unheard of if you pay attention right. to his work. So underrated, yes. Did it get a lot of radio play? Not a lot, not unless it was in quiet stone format. But we know the song. hundred percent. hundred percent. What's next for the Quiet Storm? Could we ever expect you to create a documentary or a book or something based upon your life story in the show? I am working on a book. Um, there is a documentary that has yet to be released, not on the Quiet Storm. Uh, I just play a role in the document, a radio documentary that's going to be very, very good for everyone to learn about um, and understand those radio giants who walked way before I came into the game. Uh, I think it's, it's always great to know about the history of, um, then, uh, of black radio and how it's played in, in people's lives and, and how these iconic golden voices of the past, why they had such great impact and what made them outstand so much in their creativity. So there is a documentary in the works and, and hopefully it will come out sometime uh, before this year is out. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of a Quiet Storm documentary, that would be pretty interesting because there is a history of the Quiet Storm. And like I was telling you a little earlier, Max, in, in terms of Quiet Storm, but different names. So, you know, di different people do different things. What I incorporated into my Quiet Storm um, that my mentor, Mr. Vaughn Harper didn't do, and you don't hear this a lot in a lot of Quiet Storm shows, I incorporated Confessions of Love. And the reason why I did that was because sometimes in relationships, we have a tendency to be apprehensive to talk. And as quiet as it's kept or as loud as it's said by, by ladies, men are horrible communicators when it comes to talking with them. Are you a horrible communicator with your lady? Me? No. <laughs> Good. Don't change. Communication is key. Even if it's those hard conversations, it's, it's really important. So... I do know that as couples, when we get into these relationships, we don't speak our mind openly and honestly because we don't want to upset our significant other. We're scared about how she may think about certain things. Uh, same thing with us, you know, ladies are scared too. So I said, let me create this, this middle of the road kind of thing. I'll come up with the questions. We all have an opinion, whether it's the right opinion that's the question. We all have an opinion about certain things. So I'll create the question and I'll get the feedback and everyone can sit back and either engage in the conversation with me or they can sit back and, hmm, and that's a very interesting point. Or, wow, I'm going through this as well. So let me see what people think about and get an objective perspective because I could be going, I mean, I, Look, I've used this platform for my own personal use. You know, I, I may have been hung up or stubborn about certain things, or I want to get a different opinion, you know, more than my lady, or trying to convince her why I said or think what I said. So let me put this question out there and see what everybody thinks about this question on a broad level. And it has worked. And I think hopefully it has helped. And what I also have heard from uh, my listeners is that they enjoy it because they are interested to hear how other people think about certain things. So it becomes a conversation piece. So, you know, I hope that they will consider at some point, someone will creatively come up with the concept of doing the quiet storm because the, I, I just saw something on, um, or someone had streamed it on Instagram saying, oh, I didn't even know about, do they have the quiet storm around anymore? And people were 
the, the few people who knew about me said, well, obviously you haven't heard about Lenny Green and the Quiet Storm, or you haven't heard about this or that. So, you know, some people don't get it in their cities. I mean, I'm fortunate with the Quiet Storm being in New York, but the Quiet Storm in New York is syndicated now and it goes to a few other cities. So um, we, bring, we bring an experience, going back to my first thing with you. I, I hope that when people come to my program, you're going to definitely get the music. You're going to definitely get the ambiance and the feel of relaxation, not just romance. But you're also going to get some in, some conversation, whether it's celebrity interviews or whether it's relationship talk, topics. So that's what uh, the Quiet Storm of, with Lenny Green brings. And uh, I hope I hope that we definitely come up with a concept of doing some kind of Quiet Storm documentary. You may have just planted a seed in my mind, so I may have to go to work now. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. And I'll be looking forward to that documentary. Did they tell you when you're going to be allowed to go back into the WBLS studios to do your show? I think now that a lot of people have um, been vaccinated, uh, they're kind of playing with it. They don't want to rush everyone uh, because they realize that a lot of people uh, are still, you know, after a year of living a certain different kind of life that we've never experienced before. Uh, we don't know, you know, how strongly people are open to being close to people again. I do know that a lot of folks have cabin fever. A lot of folks are itching to get out. And I think we're starting to see that uh, more and more as people travel and around certain circles. But um, they are talking about maybe after, you know, may maybe in around a month, we'll kind of play with it. Like maybe you come in for two days and then you go home and then we'll have somebody else come in and go home. But they're not trying to have a lot of people around each other just yet. So not yet. We don't have a we don't have a firm situation. Um, so we're going to see how this works. One step at a time. Yes. For sports, you're a Giant fan first, Jet fan second. How about basketball? Are you a Knicks fan? Knicks fan. And you know what? I'm a Knicks fan and a Nets fan. Now, the Nets, the Knicks are doing phenomenal mm -hmm. this season. They're doing phenomenal. I, I'm so proud. And that makes me hold and pop my, my, my collar up even more. The Nets has an all-star lineup. It's, it's hard for them to do bad. I mean, I just wish, you know, I, I wish they had, well, obviously, before they became the Brooklyn Nets, they were the New Jersey Nets. So a lot of people say, well, you can't really sell out. But I'm not selling out because I'm a Knicks fan first. Just mm -hmm. like you may not know this, I'm a Met fan. I like that. And then I'm a, and then I'm a Yankee fan, and people look at me like I have four heads. What do you mean? You're, 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 when you're a Met fan, obviously you're from Brooklyn. I got grandfathered into the Mets because my grandfather literally was a Met fan. Now, when the Mets is going to, I hope they're saying that this season is going to be great for the Mets. I hope, I hope they, I hope they are uh, because it's it's a damn shame that they ha they've only been to the World Series one time the jets have the last time the jets was in 1968 <laughs> broadway joe ah uh, it's that's ridiculous so look you know i i they gotta do better scouting or let me be a scout let me be, uh, <laughs> okay, i'll tell you who to get we gotta get this kid this kid will definitely do the trick i don't know you know these franchises not trying to spend the money for these great players and we need that you know look we're, we're new york man so we need that so spend the money owners spend the money and get the creme de la creme mm -hmm. and when you're not rooting for the giants or the jets you're rooting for the steelers and why is that out of the steelers okay so oh, but, oh, oh actually okay i know what? mean joe green <laughs> the first name the first name of green i saw on the back of a jersey Number 75, me, Joe Green. I was like, oh, man, he has my name. I love it. I love it. So, yeah, uh, yeah, man, that's it. You, you did, you, Max, you did some great research. I, I'm proud of you, man. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> Joe Green is the reason why. And you can't argue. When you look at their record, you can't argue. I mean, you, you may want to, but you can't. You know, it was a star studded, it's been a star studded team. We're going to see how they do this year. Um, but I'm football first. Basketball second, baseball third. I'm the same way. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so hold on. So um, you're from Connecticut. I get that. Uh -huh. we, don't, we don't have. Well, so who's your who's your who's your basketball and uh, football teams? Uh, my football team's the Jets, and my basketball team's the Knicks. Baseball is the Mets. You're a Mets fan too. Yeah. Wow. 
So yeah, man, I, it's 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 crazy. So we hope, hope, hopefully, hopefully, man, this this season, no matter what it is, uh, we'll we'll do great. I don't think is Russell. Russell's not going back to the Seahawks, right? Supposedly, there's rumors he may not, but as of now, it's looking like he's staying. We need him in New York. We need yeah. him. With- <laughs> We need him with the Jets. We do. Jets become a whole new different phenomenon. You get that cat. Get Russell. Yeah, that, that, I 100% agree with you on that. He's worth, he's worth the money. <laughs> I'm telling you. Oh, man. Lenny Green, is there anything else you would love to tell the audience here today? Anything else that you have coming up with your show? Anything? And also where they can follow you at on Instagram. Well, first, uh, DJ Mad Max, I want to just thank you first and foremost, man, for giving me a platform to come and join you. Uh, I've known known about you, and I thank you for reaching out to me. So thank you for this opportunity and, and talking with your audience. Um, for me, you know, with us coming out of this horrific pandemic, I'm doing things a little lightly. So normally I have done in the past my yacht parties every summer. So that's on ice. Uh, I might do uh, a birthday celebration party um, to be determined where, I don't know yet. Uh, I will... I will more than likely bring back my Lenny Green Family Day event, and that's going to be August. It will be probably the first Sunday in August of 2021. It's normally the first Sunday of every year, uh, of, of August. The reason why it's August because in remembrance of my mom, I do it in August. And I also, um, during my Family Day events, give out the Mama Green um, Women of Dignity Awards to single mothers. So because we didn't do it last year, I normally give out eight because eight is the number of, for the month of August. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to double it up. So I'm going to give out probably 16 awards to make up for 2020. So I'm going to be looking for a single, uh, somebody who, whoever may know about a single mom with children who's, you know, doing everything she could possibly do for her children. Please submit her name to me. Um, Lenny Green TQS at gmail.com or joyful entertainment at gmail.com for us to consider her. Because uh, we'd like to acknowledge her and give her her flowers and her award that she rightfully deserves. So those are the two main things I'm working on for this year. Uh, you can find me on social media, at Lenny Green, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. And like my YouTube channel, Lenny Green QS. Uh, I put up a few interviews that I've done in the past. You may have heard about them. You may have heard them, but you've never seen what goes on. So you get a chance to see it. So um, I'm thankful for those opportunities. And just like it with me every night. Um, or WBLS, or you can find Google me and you'll pop up. I'll pop up in Augusta or Milwaukee or Jacksonville, Florida. We're in a few spots around the country. So I'm thankful for those of your audience that does listen to the Quiet Storm. And if you never try me out, as I always say, uh, Mad Max, ladies, turn me on and I'm going to reciprocate the favor to you. <laughs> That's exactly right. Every night, 7 p.m. Eastern time. I want to thank you, Lenny Green, for what you've done for radio and for coming on my show. You're an icon, one of the greatest voices in radio history, 100%, no doubt about it. Thank you for coming on the show here. It's been an honor. And thank you for all that you do for not just radio, but R&B as well and highlighting the greats that have come along from the generations before us, which is the youth. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. DJ Mad Max, you're the best. Again, I thank you, man. I look forward to joining you anytime you need. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day, Lenny. You too, my brother.